Here's a little story to illustrate our text for today. Well, we were just sitting down to dinner when we heard a knock on the door. When I opened it, two men stood there. One said his name was Peter, the other said his name was Andrew. Peter said, can we join you at our table? We have some good news for you. Well, they said they were fishermen from Capernaum and well, we enjoy hearing news from other villages, so we invited him into dinner that had just been set for us. We ate, and then we settled back to hear their tale. They told us that they'd been sent by Jesus, this uh, prophet from Nazareth, son of Joseph. We'd heard rumors about this carpenter from our neighbors and other people. A carpenter turned prophet. How interesting. Well, I guess that's the pattern in the scriptures, isn't it? One story did disturb me, though. They said the village where Jesus came from rejected him. Well, we kind of understood that. You know, I mean, look at it. A local handyman who used to fix your broken door is now going around saying that he's a, a prophet or something. Well, no wonder they threw him out of town. They must have thought he was a false prophet. But these men, Peter and Andrew had been traveling with him for months and, and knew what he had to say and, and watched what he was doing. They were eyewitnesses of his words and his works. And they were convinced he was the Messiah. Imagine. Peter insisted that the reports we'd heard about Jesus were true. And not only that, but Andrew astonished us by telling us even more. He said that Jesus had sent them out to do the same thing he was doing. Healing, casting out demons, preaching. <laughs> I suppose my wife and I looked at them rather skeptically. <laughs> After all, I mean, Peter and Andrew, they're just fishermen, right? Well, then... Uh, Peter remembered that we'd set the table, but there was a table setting that was missing. And, and since this wasn't the Seder, he, he wondered who was supposed to be sitting at that table, <laughs> at that table setting. And well, I said our son was sick and didn't want to eat. He's over by the fire there. So, so Peter asked if he could go talk to him. And, and uh, I, well, what could it hurt? I said, yes. So Peter goes over to him and lays his hands on them and says, By the power of Jesus, be healed. Well, my son sits up and decides maybe he could eat a little of that stew his mama made. And so he, he came out and ate. And, and as we watched him, Peter said, The kingdom of God has come to this house. We've come to tell your village about this good news. The Messiah has come, and he is Jesus of Nazareth. Well, let's read about this in the scriptures. Mark 6, 6 the second part of the verse, and through verse 13. Then we'll look at some details and implications of this story. So here's, here it is. He, that's Jesus, went about among the villages teaching, and he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And he said to them, Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that's on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. 
And they cast out many demons, and anointed with oil many who were sick, and healed them. Okay, um, six, the second part of the verse is a transition. Mark uses these transitions from one story to another. And it says that uh, Jesus went out to all the villages. This was a, a mission. He ministers in all of Galilee, but this time by engaging his disciples to do the same things that he was doing. So, in verse 7, Jesus told his disciples to travel two by two. Why is that important? Well, there, first, there are at least three reasons for traveling in pairs. It was for mutual support, so they could encourage each other on the way. It was because Deuteronomy had said that you can tell if something is true by having two or three witnesses. So it was important to have more than one person saying something. And, of course, being fallible human beings and having our own ideas about things, two people would be self-corrective. They would correct each other. They'd make sure that no one of them started down a wrong path. In verse 8, then, Jesus tells them what to take and what not to take. The point was that these disciples were on an urgent mission, so they had to travel lightly without a lot of encumbrances. Later, he asked them in Luke uh, 22, verse 3, if they'd lacked anything. And he said to them, when I sent you out without a money bag and a traveler's bag and sandals, you didn't lack anything, did you? And they said, no, nothing. But then Jesus sent them out again on this mission. But this time, the second time after his resurrection, this was a lifelong mission. They were calling Israel to repentance so they wouldn't be destroyed. That's why the mission was so urgent. The people didn't know what was coming. What they were doing was an extension of Jesus' own mission after he had ascended into where he was before. It was also carried out in the same way. Like him, for this short-term mission, they had to depend utterly on God's provision through his people. It was also training them to depend on God then for the rest of their lives during the second mission, which continues to this day. In verse 11 then, it says they were supposed to shake the dust off their feet. What is that about? Well, that's what the Jews were supposed to do. They were supposed to, when they came from a Gentile area, they were supposed to shake even the dust off their feet. So, when the disciples did it to a Jewish town, that meant that these people in that village that had rejected them were just like Gentiles. They were outside the kingdom of God. They were in grave danger of judgment because they were defiled like they thought the Gentiles were. But why were they defiled? Well, it's because they didn't accept that the truth of the kingdom of God had come to them in the person of Jesus, represented by these disciples. It was a prophetic warning to them. They were now outside. Mark uses inside, outside to separate Believers from unbelievers, you see. It's interesting that Jesus gave them this instruction. Not so much that he gave them this instruction, but that he gave them this instruction right after, this is the way Mark is portraying it, right after he was rejected from his hometown, Nazareth. If you read a similar account in Matthew 11, 20 to 22, you'll hear Jesus judging the towns of Galilee that these men had gone to and that Jesus had performed a lot of miracles in. This is what he says. 
Then he began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Quo to you, Chorazin! Quo to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. That's serious challenge, serious warning about judgment. All right. Now, there are four interconnected purposes for the disciples' mission. First, Jesus is training him for this ministry that they would continue for the rest of their lives. Second, he's advancing the kingdom of God through more than himself. Third, as Matthew recorded, it was the prophetic warning to the villages of Galilee. Since the kingdom of God was advancing, judgment was also on their doorstep. Four, Jesus was calling laborers to his harvest. That is, he's gathering the people of God into his kingdom. And God's people are those who believe in Jesus, the Son of God, who was, well, not conceived of flesh, but by the Spirit of God. Jesus needed them, because even though he was the Son of God, he was just one man at this time, and so he was limited by his body to be in only one place at one time. So in order to advance this kingdom, he needed more workers to go forward. So he chose these 12 men from hundreds of people who were following him, and he demonstrated how the kingdom of God attacked and overcame the kingdom of Satan. This is the whole idea behind casting out demons and healing people. He's breaking into the kingdom of Satan that's ruling this world. So now the time has arrived for his apprentices to take the show on the road, as it were, go out there for themselves for the first time, trusting the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus waged his battle with these forceful men thrusting forward, throwing out Satan's agents, these demons, healing diseases that they cause, or and that is caused just by nature, assuring eternal life as people repented from their unbelief and warning the opposition of their impending and imminent destruction. It was coming, and it was coming soon. This was an urgent message, an urgent mission. But what is this kingdom of God that he's been talking about? Dallas Willard helped me in this, uh, in his book. He wrote that God's kingdom is where he has the final say. Your kingdom is where you have final say. Maybe it's only to your dog, but, well, I don't know if the dog would agree or not, but that's what, that's what this is. The kingdom of God is where God has final say. But Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Apparently, God's will is not being done on earth. Jesus told us to pray that God will have final say on earth. You know, God's Spirit has been working in creation from the beginning of creation, but for some reason, His will isn't being done on earth. I've heard too many people say everything has happens for a reason. Well, you may not like the reason that it's happening, and it may not be from God, because God's final say isn't on the earth yet. So, what does it say that the kingdom of God came near to the villages? What were those villages supposed to repent of? Well, remember Jesus' hometown, Nazareth? He didn't demonstrate God's will there. The power of the kingdom of God was there, but it wasn't 
demonstrated to them through miracles and mighty wonders. Why? It's because they didn't believe in him. Belief is so important. The kingdom of God came to them in the person of the king, but they rejected him, and so they didn't see the power and the love of the kingdom of God in their village. But the villages that did welcome him and his disciples did experience the kingdom of God overcoming Satan, casting out demons, healing diseases, and even raising people from the dead. Jesus' call to repentance is aim, as John the Baptist was saying. He also commanded people to repent. Were they repenting of, I don't know, various sins that they'd committed? And, well, I suppose those were included, but that's not the major point. It's a, like a, a symptom of the major point. John is calling them to repent in unbelief of the kingdom of God. The mission of John the Baptist was to prepare the way of the Lord, so he called people to repent of unbelief, and that was before Jesus was known. John the Baptist says, you don't know who's standing among you. He didn't even know until Jesus had been revealed. So the people, what were they doing? They were worshiping what they thought they knew of God. Let me paraphrase what Paul points out in Romans 10, verses 2 to 11. This kind of explains it. Speaking of the Israelites at this time, he says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes about the righteousness that's based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But they weren't doing the commandments. They weren't obeying them. But the righteousness based on faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven, as if they could bring the Messiah down from there by their good works, or who will descend into the abyss that is if their good works could bring the Messiah up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth. It's in your heart. That's the word of faith that we proclaim, Paul says. Here's what that word of faith means. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here's why. With the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture promises, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. That's Paul's explanation. So John called them to repent because they were not worshiping in truth, as Paul says. They thought their good works would bring the Messiah to save them. John is calling them to repent of unbelief because they didn't have faith in God, but in their own efforts. They had faith in their own works of righteousness. Then Jesus came, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, demonstrating the kingdom of God had come to the villages in the person of himself, the Messiah. He came solely because God wanted him to. It wasn't from anything anyone had done, good works or not. God just wanted to. It's called the grace of God. The disciples then were tasked to proclaim this to the villages that the kingdom of God has come and to demonstrate it through these works of 
casting out demons, healing people, raising people from the dead, and preaching. And the early churches then continued to experience the power of the kingdom of God. And there's, there's no indication that the authority that was given to the disciples had stopped. There were people with doing the same sorts of things that weren't walking with Jesus and hadn't seen him. Has Jesus' commission to his disciples continued for over 2,000 years to us? How can we be expected to advance the kingdom of God in our world our, and our personal world? The kingdom of God has come through Jesus breaking into this kingdom of Satan that rules this world, he breaks in with the power to save people from it. Paul uses the word transfer, to transfer them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. That's the way Paul puts it. So if you believe what Jesus told us, it can also come into your world with the power of God and the love of God. God's kingdom is where he has final say. It's where his will is done. That didn't extend to Nazareth because they didn't believe. And apparently not to the other villages as well with this warning that Jesus gave them. But it does extend to you if you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior God and if you confess him with your mouth. We are disciples of Jesus. And like the first disciples, we are commissioned to be his heralds, to proclaim the kingdom of God has come. That's why Jesus told us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why pray that if it was already here? Functioning, taken over. The will of God through Jesus is for us to bring that kingdom of God with love and justice to people, to call them to repentance from unbelief, to save them in Jesus' name. That's our marching orders, you could say. It's an urgent matter of life or death for people. For the kingdom of God will come fully to earth and the king will rule on earth as he does in heaven. And that prayer that Jesus taught us to pray will be answered. And let all the earth rejoice then because the king is ruling and with it justice with the love of God on all people. Are you going to do your commissioning? You're going to tell anybody? Amen.